Hey everybody, how's it going? Hopefully your St. Con's going good. Uh, morning keynotes and lunch, and if you're still just in this room for me eating lunch, feel free to stay. Um, my name is uh, James Pope. Everybody just calls me Pope because they find that easier to say, and not because I'm really into Catholicism or anything, but it's just born that. I have been asked that question many a times. <laughs> And uh, today I'm presenting a, a Security 101 track um, on Think Like a Hacker. Still just a little hot. Thank you. Um, this is, you know, generally you don't put in shady URLs, but a lot of people keep asking me to uh, give them the uh, slide deck later. Um, it's not a lot of use for you, but there is a link to the slide deck if you wanted to follow along on your phone or later if you, you chose to. And I can come back to that later if you want it. <coughs> um, so who, who am I? A little intro here. I'm a partner in my own company. It's called Pope Tech. Uh, real original, right? We just put tech at the end of our name. Um, and then do lots of things, technology and security. So, um, so I work there. And I actually still hold a job uh, doing stuff for it's a, a theater chain uh, based out of Los Angeles. I've been in movie theaters um, since like the year 2000. So I've done a lot of stuff in the theater world. Um, I have a member of... DC801, and we're trying to start like a DC435. I moved up to Logan, so I'm working on that. Um, also, I'm uh, one of the committee members here at St. Con. Uh, I also help run B-Sides, and I'm like a team lead at Black Hat Knock every year, and I sit on some associations for theater cybersecurity stuff as well. I do have some degrees and certs, but that's not really fun to talk about. Um, so you're here to think like a hacker, uh, how to learn to be a hacker, what, you know, wh you know, what motivates them, how do you get in that mindset? And uh, you know, some of that is, is kind of simplistic and some of it's also very complicated. So we're gonna touch on a few of them. And the, the way I know how to relate to this the, is to tell you a story about how I came to think like a hacker and a lot of the stuff I do. Um, when I was young, we got computers, came to us from other family members, their older computers. And we had a screen that was very similar to this. This one's a point of sale. I couldn't find one exactly. Um, one of my uncles who would provide it was uh, an administrator at a K through 12 and would lock them down. So we saw these DOS menus that were completely locked down to what you could do, like word processor and a few other stuff. So we were all stuck in this of like what the ideal parent wants their kid to do, right? Just sit there and like, I don't know, write articles <laughs> or something. Um, so what we did instead is we figured out how to make boot disks, right? And DOS boot disk and put them in before they boot up and get command prompt and we could do whatever we want, right? We can load, you know, Commander Keen, right? So one of my biggest drivers in life was Commander Keen. We would do that and uh, Monster Bash over here that you just sit there and play these for hours. Parents leave, play for, we, we only have access to word processors, so that's what we do, right? Until they leave, reboot the machine, get admin on it essentially, but the whole drive was to play video games. And this is like age 10-ish, <laughs> something in there. And they came to more controls, right? So the computer suddenly had this like tumbler key lock on the thing, and we couldn't turn it on, right? Somehow we got ratted out, found out that we're just sitting there playing Commander Keen all the time, right? So we had this physical lock, and that did stop us for a bit. We were just beating our head, <laughs> like, I can't, can't play computer, can't turn it on. Like, how do you do anything here? until um, one day I took it apart and jumped it, right? I, just, I remember staring at that switch for like two minutes, like, it's just two wires, right? Like, what does this thing actually do? So we jumped it, computer boots up, hey, put it back together, play video games, right? This is the drive. Get it back together, video games. So Jetpack, I don't know if anybody played that, that was a big, big favorite as well. So we just the whole drive was just sit there to play these video games. We had them on discs, labeled what they were, we're copying them, parents are breaking them, destroying them, hiding them up in ceiling tiles, right? Like, the whole drive was, it was not to me, anybody ever just said like, hey, you should think like a hacker, you should be a hacker, you should uh, cybersecurity or security controls or circumvent these things. It was just a drive to play video games at the time, right? So really, I think like a hacker, the primary motive there is just to think different about it. It's, it's just to come at something that you're not used to, right? Um, depending what that is, it could be completely different. Your mindset could already be geared for this. It could also be geared of like, hey, I only do PCI compliance or I only do this framework. And that's the only way somebody's going to come at me is through that. And 
what I'm asking you to do, we're going to go down a, a, a rabbit hole today of thinking like a hacker. Think just a little bit different about a situation. So um, I did what anybody would do. I want to become a hacker, right? So I, I go to WikiHow. I'm like, hey, like, how do you become a hacker, right? And this is the article, How to Think Like a Big Hacker. So that's actually my bad that my presentation wasn't as cool as their topic. They got big in there. And they have these bullet points, which is great. Um, and some of these are pretty interesting. I just, I thought it was interesting. I just want to share it. Identify possible exploits and their domain names, gathering as much information as you can, and create a footprint analysis. It's actually not that far off. It's not really great, but it's not as far off. Pay attention. Step two, that's step one. There's only five steps. You can, in WikiHow, you can become a big hacker. Five easy steps. So by the time we're done here, you guys are all going to be, you know, sitting here like this. This is you guys, right? You ready? These five steps? Okay. All right, so step one. Step two, pay attention to backdoor entry points. So there you go. Just pay attention to those. That's step two. <laughs> step three, uh, go ahead and just connect to all their ports, their UDP and TCP ports, and see what's running on those. That's actually not bad. Um, step four, think about how you will gain access to the target once you've learned that information. So you got these ports, you know they got some FTP server on there, and how are you going to gain access to that? So we're really close now. You're about ready to become a hacker. You ready? Step five, take that username and password that you got, Trojan it. Okay? So here we go. We all got our, we got our hoods on, and we're all hackers now, right? We passed WikiHow. Um, I saw this one. It came on Twitter last night of a police agency, I think it's in Australia, that just posted this yesterday. I'm not going to read all this because it's really long. But they essentially 14 steps to spot a hacker. This is like last night on Twitter, and, and the, the InfoSec world was pretty much just like uh, killing this thing, right? But some of these are pretty funny. Um, and I think would probably classify, everybody in this room probably has seven of these. I would actually, you know, we could probably take a poll and I bet seven people, you'd have seven of these traits, almost every single person in this room, right? Like, spend more of your time on a computer than you do with people. Like, uh, yeah, I'd probably do that, right? Um, <laughs> use terms like DDoS and Pwn. Yeah, okay. Do you have multiple email addresses? Hacker, right? <laughs> You're a hacker. You cannot do that. Uh, multiple social media profiles on one platform? Mm. You're probably enumerating somebody on LinkedIn there, right? Things like Tor, red flag, can't do that. Selling computer games online, cheats online, you're a hacker. Your internet connection goes slow. Yeah, hacker. <laughs> it's not Comcast, hacker. Um, and it's long, there's a bunch in there, it's not worth reading all. But I was like, uh, you know, if, I think if you do these 14 things, you're also hooting on, ready to go, right? And the, the interesting thing is, you kind of are, right? Like, I was thinking like a hacker as a little kid, a little bit, but that wasn't really the drive, and that's probably not somebody you're trying to protect against. Now, granted, physical access is important, and there are some controls and things that should be put in place, but that maybe is not what you're against, and it, maybe it's a little different. So I did some, I've, I do a bunch of work, and on those we do engagements, and some of those have been straight up pen tests, and I did some for the state of Utah. I worked at UEN on uh, helping going around a lot of K through 12, but I also did dumb some, oh, geez did some plenty of those afterwards, and we do a lot of consulting, and a lot of it's compliance driven. And I like to break it down to like, here's kind of the reality, right? You have things, and security frameworks are great, and I'm actually a big proponent of security frameworks when they're used for the right reasons. When they're used to improve your security posture and not used for compliance over security. And if you're doing compliance over security, I've legitimately done and been at orgs that have completely passed a PCI or whatever the compliance is, and have completely failed at security, right? Like, do we have a IPS? Yes, we do. Well, it's not even on any applied correct zone. It's not in any of the zones that you actually have traffic on. Yeah, but it asked if we had one. It didn't say we implemented it correctly, right? And so that's where I have a hard time with. And I actually always talk to customers up front, like, listen, if you're trying to improve your posture, I'll help work with you. If you literally just want a checkbox, you should go somewhere else. And there's plenty of people who will do that, unfortunately. But there, and in, in PCI, another racket, right? You can literally just hire another person who, if you get like a bad one. I don't like that. Let me just hire another one, right? But, so this is what I'm seeing like orgs generally getting taken down from and when we do engagements, how we usually take it down. And so phishing is the top one. And I kind of lump phishing together with some other social engineering, um, but generally just phishing users. And I don't want to beat up users, but it's a reality in your org. Um, users and 
I am a big advocate of putting controls in to also mitigate some stuff that users do. But phishing, walking through the front door, right? We'll get to that. Shodan, I'm going to put it in zone because I use it a lot and it's pretty amazing. If you're doing a single target, not as amazing. If you're just swathing the internet for things, Shodan's amazing. We'll touch on that for a second. Um, leveraging what you have once you get any type of foothold. We'll go over that for a second. And then, uh, of course, you're just going to ransomware it because why wouldn't you? Um, least we're going to talk about is this missing patches. That's not really fun to talk about, but it's definitely um, legitimate. It's out there. And Shodan does use some of that, so we'll touch on it just for a bit. So for phishing, unfortunately in the world, if you just take all the things you're trying to go after, it is almost this easy in some scenarios. Like legitimately, like you just have to try like a tool or a thing, and here they go, right? Like can you go get an open source phishing uh, program, GoFish or something, and implement it? and then tweak it on yourself until you eventually get it to pass their filters. Um, it is almost as easy as just, you know, well, I don't need to throw down a rod and do one at a time. I can just start picking up a bunch. Um, phishing, a lot of times, they're generally after a few things. Uh, portals is a login page that they want you to put in some information. Um, when you do a, a, a pen test engagement, it's generally the way they go. A lot of people don't like you to drop payloads. Uh, sometimes they're in scope and you can drop payloads, but otherwise it's a link, uh, Google Authenticate. Authenticate here. Um, what I actually found that works the best, if I were to say there's one phishing portal that works the best, is a, a website that I own called like voteforsite.com. And it just legitimately lets you vote for a website. Like your company has a brand new website coming out. Pick out of these templates. What do you want to pick? And everybody loves to choose the direction of the look and feel of some CSS, right? They're like, ah, that one. And it actually tells them like, thanks for information. and and submits it. It doesn't go to an air page and redirects them back to their home page. And people just love to do that, including like sysadmins and domain admins, which is nuts, right? But these portals, they work because people don't stop and pay attention. Payloads is generally something that they want to execute in your system. This can absolutely be mitigated on a lot of scenarios by IT. You guys can run a lot of things to mitigate payloads. However, there are still things like beef and hooking browsers. Um, but payloads, and do they have Adam? What can you leverage of their admin credential once you're on a system? So we'll touch on those. We've seen this basic one. However, I do want to touch on some of these. So some of these, if they're way under where you're at, apologies, but this is a one-on-one -on -one track. So we're going to touch on some of the basic stuff. These are the basic validating where it comes from. This is, you know, are things worded right? Are they looking weird? Are these URLs going to the wrong places? And some of these are getting much and much harder. As much as we know some of these, like, yeah, let's hover over a link and see that. Tell me how you do that on your cell phone. Well, you can hold down on it for a while, and then it pops up and maybe gives you some options on what you can do. So things, as we know more, things are getting harder. Some of these URLs that obfuscate where you go, they intentionally make them long to go off of your cell phone. Right? On a desktop, it would like, that looks shady. But on your mobile, uh, I don't know. So some things are getting a little more complicated with some of that stuff. And we've seen these generally with phishing, the um, way I advocate people is to validate at the source. Timing is always on your side. You can always go validate at the source, right? You don't need to act on what they act. If I show up with a Comcast shirt on and say, hey, is your internet running slow? Your answer is generally yes, right? And I'm here to fix it. I need it in your data center, right? The answer is generally yes. But you should be able to validate that from the source. And that source is not the business card I hand you with somebody sitting in a truck outside, right? That source is you go call Comcast. You call, some, you call the vendor directly. You validate at the source. If you get, and we, we always want to act on a position of something that you can get into much smarter people that will tell you the positions of fear and um, cloud and all these other reasons why your emotional triggers get you to act on some of this stuff. But it's generally like they want you to do something now and timing is on your side. It is in your best interest to not act on that email to think about it, to go over to validate at the source, right? So things like this, like, hey, your email account's going to get shut down. That actually could happen if somebody didn't pay a bill. And that's scary, and I got emails, and you can't take away my emails. If you take my emails, I can't work, right? Or Slack, depending which work you're in. But you can't take that away. And this is a legit scenario you might be concerned about. But you contact your IT team. You contact your provider, Microsoft, Google. You contact them. You don't click this link and validate that, right? If Chase says your credit card is expired or it's been declined or in this scenario like this, right? This, is, this would be interesting, right? Email security alert, hey, 
you just logged in from Russia. Well, <laughs> I'm a security person. I'm shutting that down now, right? Well, that's actually what they want you to do. <laughs> Click here, <laughs> put in your password, portal, harvest credentials, or payload. Drop a payload, right? So this one's just a position of like, oh, you've already been compromised. Like, whoa, right? Chase sends you a, an email out. Hey, you've already been compromised. Click here to you know, freeze your card or get a new one. You might be freaking out about that. Validate at the source. Always validate at the source. Timing is on your side. So these are getting better and better. Less is the language weird. And there's still plenty of those that are out there, but most of those are just spraying. And some people still do it. But they're getting better and better. This is a well-crafted email. This is a well-crafted email. Um, there might be some, a few things in there you can think about, but overall, these could happen, which is why they're triggers, right? Somebody could log in your email account from Russia. Your provider might give you an alert for that. That would be concerning, unless you're in Russia. Maybe not so concerning. But here in Utah, that'd be a red flag for me. Validate at that source, right? This one, I've used this in a few, dem uh, few presentations I've done, and and let me, let me be clear on a bunch of these examples. I don't pull these off the internet. These are from things that worked. <laughs> this worked, right? Somebody was like, I got to download this doc file. Or, yeah, this was a doc file. Send them to a doc file. I got to download this doc file and enable that macro, right? In this scenario, what would you do to validate this? Um, for those who can't read in the back, I know it, I try to make them big, but it is a long room. This is a divorce letter, right? from an attorney who's coming from something shady like uh, co.zod slash divorce, right? Uh, if your attorney's there, um, they sh you shouldn't have that attorney. <laughs> but let alone, and, and this could be a real thing. I hope it's not in your life. I hope your spouse, uh, hopefully you've had some conversations before would reach something like this. However, even if it wasn't, it shouldn't be immediately like, oh, screw them. I'm going to preemptive, you know, and click on these things like, you should call your spouse, probably, right? You're going to have to have a conversation at some point. Um, but it shouldn't be good either, because this might be malicious, right? So. All right. This, this one is huge. I don't know why this still works. I'm just amazed how many people have not implemented, or Microsoft directly has not just disabled this by default on, like, GPIO or uh, uh, group policies, haven't just pushed, like, no macros. Mac I'm not saying macros aren't a thing. In some Excel documents, I definitely see them still being a thing, and they shouldn't be. But I've never seen a legitimate word macro. I don't know. They probably have a purpose, but you not anymore. Like, I've never seen a legitimate word macro. You can absolutely create a policy that just says, like, that can't run in my org. And you can do it on an individual computer, or you can do it through a group policy. That should not run. You should not run macros out of a Word document. It makes no sense. Like, um, the way to break it down to people, uh, what a macro is, you're essentially saying, I would like this script to run on my machine. Right? So let's put it into actual English. I would like this malicious file, maybe malicious, maybe not, I want this file to run on my machine. Not just view an invoice, let alone an invoice shouldn't really be coming in a Word file anyway, let alone have a macro. And the brand new version of this that I just got like a week ago, this one. So this one's pretty hot right now. And they're already starting to skin them with the Office 365 brand new ones or the 2019 version that just came out. Same color, same fill. They're going to say things like, oh, it's compatibility mode. And essentially what they say is two things. Enable editing, enable content. Take me out of my sandbox, run a script. Take me out of my sandbox, run a script. If you don't want that doc file to run a script on your machine, enable content should be viewed the same as like, let's run this EXE. Well, that makes your hair stick up. I don't want to run EXE. But I do want to see the invoice that guy sent that's delinquent, right? Yeah. I'm not his customer, but I'm really curious. <laughs> Again, these are all shown because they work. This works. This is probably going rampant right now. There's probably people doing it right now. Hopefully nobody in this room, but this works. You have these amazing things like, hey, check your password and see if it's a good password. That's a terrible idea, by the way, Bec <laughs> especially on this site, right? I don't know what this site's saying. However, definitely had a user, got reported to me. How to deal with this, this is the site they went to, put in their password. I just want to see if it was secure. It might have been. <laughs> <laughs> it's not anymore. That password's gone. You got to get rid of that. Uh, and then these things still work. This was, a, uh, this was actually a few months back. It's probably April-ish. These things work. You uh, go to a site. They have some shady ad. 
and the ad renders this thing and takes over your whole screen, right? And people are like, I don't know, I'm just going to click the blue things. <laughs> You're like, oh, it's just, uh, you're over, uh, what was that talk this morning? Uh, you know, how, where to put UI and make you do the right choices? I don't know. This one, I think by giving you two options, both terrible, we're more likely to pick one of them probably. People are like, uh, I guess install Flash. <laughs> Flash is a good thing in security world, right? Let's put Flash in there. And then these ones. This, I had to help a friend with this. Uh, he was a, an elderly gentleman, and he gave them money. Right? His screen got taken over. And this one's really hard to see, but it's like, hey, malicious pornographic spyware slash riskware detected. Let's just cover all the things. <laughs> it's either pornography or spyware or riskware. Like, eh, you know, between that combination, you did it, right? And you need to call us immediately. Do not, do not ignore this. And on mobile phones, on some of them, they will take over the whole screen and people freak out, like reboot it, shut it down. Like, you can hit the back button, right? Just hit the back button. And sometimes, Depending how they coded it, that back button will just load it again, load it again, but you can just open the app drawer and close it. But people will just like stop and worse, call them, right? Microsoft doesn't ever call you. They don't. They don't call you like, hey, I know you need support today, right? <laughs> I've not seen that. I've got, hey, we got an audit. I've got that from Microsoft. But I don't get a call, hey, let's help you with support today, right? But yet people pay them. This stuff works. Um, any questions when on the phishing? I, this came around Facebook a while ago. This has been years ago, but this was around like, this is so-and-so, and I tweaked it, and I was like, quit sharing all this crap on Facebook. Anyway, who, who knew they'd be sharing it with everybody in the world, right? All right. Um, we can, I can chat with anybody afterwards if you have any questions or at the end of the talk, too. Um, let's talk about cred, passwords. Um, so I put in there, just walk through the front door. So a lot of times on the engagement, whatever the client is, I just take their domain name and just check that domain name for already known creds out there. What are the chances they've changed them? Actually, it's not bad. Most are changed them. I'd probably say 60, 70% have probably changed it, but it's something like spring 2017 something, right? Oh, let's try summer, fall, right? Um, the known... So there, there are, you can absolutely go get dumps of these breaches. Um, be careful on where you get. Probably have I been, he, sorry, I should know better, I do AV. I'm supposed to repeat his question. He asked, where can he check to know that if his domain has been compromised, right? If there's known creds out there, probably uh, Troy Hunt's have I been pwned is probably your safest place to do that. You just put in your email address, it validates you own it, and it will send it to you. The part I don't like about that is I wish he would tell me what he has. Instead, he just says, yes, it was in there, and it was a part of this breach, and, but it doesn't say uh, they had your password and they had this, and this is your password, and if you see this anywhere else, you're still screwed, right? You need to go change that. Um, I wish they would, sh once you validated you own that domain, I wish it would actually give you that data, but what he's doing is a great service already, and that data is already out there. If you're more into more advanced stuff, you can absolutely go and get these dumps. The problem is, is sometimes they are other malicious files, so you need to have really good sandboxing, and um, a lot of times you've got to go and tour and get validated on some form, and you can get access to a lot of this stuff. It's probably it's over 101. That's not 101. 101, go to haveibeenpwned.com, put in your email address, and see if you've been pwned, right? Um, in fact, this stat came from Troy Hunt's site. 500 million creds, different creds. And of that, I think he said 80% uh, are terrible, right? Uh, so these are creds. So the first thing you do is just go look at that and see if we can just log in, right? Hey, you'll pull up that username, go check LinkedIn. Oh, that guy's an IT guy. Perfect. He's got privileged access, right? So the password guidelines are kind of changing. I put this in here because people are still pushing for this hard. Um, the every rotate it every 90 days. And that absolutely has purposes for like IT and escalated people and people having persistent access. And if you're using vault managers, it can still work. The reality is most people just make even worse passwords. They use spring, they use fall, they use summer, they use quarter one, quarter two, quarter three. They use some variation. They just keep adding a one and an exclamation point, you know, to some extent until they get past whatever rule. I oh, don't care, one exclamation point, right? So what they've come out with NIST and all the other uh, guidelines are essentially saying, of, of all the studies of us telling people to rotate their passwords, it's actually been counter, it's been making passwords worse. And so they just changed it to, this is the new standard. 
Um, it's still being pushed out through different things, but most have adopted it. Most compliant um, frameworks and compliance are on this, but not in a dictionary. So that's what we just talked about. It cannot be on a known breach password. If the, your password is already compromised somewhere, you put it in a Russian portal, it's gone. You can't use it again. That password is gone. Just assume it's gone. That's a token. That token's expired. You need a new token, okay? Don't reuse them service the system. Your business shouldn't take down your personal life. Your personal life shouldn't take down your business. There are things, and, and some people take this to the, the umpteenth degree, and I would say just classify your life, right? If uh, you have a Yelp account and you don't really care about your Yelp account, who cares about your password to some extent, right? That can be something that you maybe share with something else. However, if you're like a buddy of mine who is an avid Yelp person who spends all their time there and has like hundreds if not thousands of things, it's really important to him, well, maybe you want to seg segment that, right? Your Netflix, well, they take over from it. They might increase your account. They might change something. Depending on your effort, how much you care about that, maybe that's a lower classification to you and you don't care as much. But my banking, my work email, my personal email, the things that I reset passwords to, those are different. They have to be different. There's no way one should take down the other one. You have to assume that website, like uh, this is the best example. When I started in information security, or way actually before that, I got, I got this website was breached. I was restoring this old truck called, uh, it, it was FordTruckEnthusiast.com. I think it still exists. And I was restoring this old truck and I was posting photos to the world of how amazing my truck was, right? And it got breached and it like took out my email, it took out my banking, it took out, and I was just like, what? Right? I didn't know any better. But Ford truck enthusiasts of your life should not take down your banking, shouldn't take down your email, shouldn't take down your org. Those should be broken out by service. If you have something critical, some database administrator password, separate that. Make it something unique. Vault manager by your friend, we'll touch, touch on that. Length is the preferred. It's harder for cracking rigs, right? They don't say that in the compliance thing, but length is preferred. The longer your password, the harder it is for computation to crack it in a hash. Two-factor is your friend, but don't just rely on two-factor, right? The company I own, we also have developers around dev shops. I, we, we take over a lot of bad code, and uh, two-factor is not always implemented properly. If you're like, I can use whatever crappy password I want, like P at sword one exclamation point because I have two-factor on, I think you should elevate that a little bit, right? You should, security is always layers. It shouldn't be assuming there's one thing that stops everything, right? Multiple things. Two-factor is your friend. I, I absolutely been on engagements where we've got their complete credentials through a portal, through whatever other means. We log in and it sends them an alert. Hey, we're logging in and want to validate this is you. And they're like, no, right? You get shut down and they know you're doing it. Two-factor is your friend. Put it on all the important things in your life, your email, your banking, core switches, routers, firewalls. Put it on the things that are important. Two-factor is is. Actually, one of those, like, I'm not going to say silver bullet, but it helps a lot of things. It really mitigates a lot of things. It's that extra layer of control behind a user making a terrible decision. If you don't know what two-factor is, Google it. And multi-factor doesn't count. A lot of people are like, oh, it's two-factor. I put a username password in and then another password. And I'm like, ugh. You need something to separate that. If you already have a key logger on machine A, you will also have both of those things, right? Vault managers are your friends. Um, depending on your level of paranoia, you can have anything from an online one that syncs everything for you to a local version that if your hard drive crashes, you lose everything, right? Somewhere in there is probably safe. Regardless, it's still probably better than what you're doing without. You can get into uh, some Aaron Toppins and stuff with uh, password cards and stuff and, and get really crazy. And he, that guy's amazing. And it's all math and entropy and wizards. Um, but password vault manager friend. I, people always ask me, what do you recommend vault managers? The answer is whoever looks at a security vulnerability and mitigates it. You can never say a code will be perfect from vulnerabilities, but whoever's looking at it and mitigating it. There's probably two primary ones out there that you know of. Um, the small ones that nobody looks at the code, it's like a WordPress plugin that's just been hanging out there for 10 years. Treat it skeptical. Okay, moving on. Um, <laughs> yeah, any questions on that? Yeah, this just happened like yesterday. Cisco just announced another uh, hard cred password in their program. It's like the sixth one this year, I'm pretty sure, which is just crazy. Okay, Shodan. I, I bring this up, and I'm actually going to tell the story through somebody else. There's this guy, his name is Vis, on Twitter. He's great. He does a lot of things in Shodan. 
Uh, I've done a lot of things in Shodan, but his stuff is like extra. But this story tells it perfectly. Newegg got uh, breached this whole MAGA cart thing. Um, I probably said that wrong. And he essentially is telling the story about how this is probably worse than you think, right? So he posts up there, oh, Newegg got compromised. Let's have a look. Oh, yeah, $5 says it's worse than you think. And the reason I share that is because the four screenshots he attaches is better than any way I could teach you how to use Shodan. Essentially, he posts the terminal output of Shodan that just says, here's the ports that are open from Newegg, right? Then in there, there's a prettier graphic interface that says, here's the ports that are open, and here's the services that have been enumerated on said ports. Now, he has not ran a vulnerability scan against them. He has not even touched them. He's literally just logged into Shodan. And Shodan, if you don't know, is essentially a search engine for all the vulnerable things on the internet. It's probably the best way to describe it. But in there, you're seeing some things, and if more security people might start seeing red flags, like, oh, you know, RDP is open on their server. It's weird, right? To the world. This is to the world. It's not behind a VPN. This is to the world. Okay, so we already have a terminal output of ports. You already have a graphical interface for ports, some enumeration already. So, you know, that, that wiki how, a little right, but you don't even have to go through that effort anymore. No, I'll just go to Shodan and look at that. Look, it's wide open. Uh, next, it even will take screenshots of the thing. Shodan will try to hit a service like RDP and take a screenshot of it and just leave it in their portal. So you don't even have to hit their server to know, hey, look, we got a banner here that says IT. This is an IT department server. Oh, cool. That might be useful, right? It might even tell you exactly what server edition they're running. And this is newer on Shodan, which is pretty cool, but it actually will dump you the CVE for the vulnerabilities that it was able to enumerate off that server. So some of this is pretty interesting, kind of scary. You can check it yourself. It's always good to check yourself for that. But if you're going to hit just a client, first thing you do is just hit that. A client onboards, wants to look at their security, I go put them in a Shodan. Well, what does the rest of the world already know about you? If it's this, you got some work to do, right? All right, let's briefly touch on ransomware. Uh, we don't spend a ton of time on it, but it has definitely been aided by crypto coins. It's definitely been aided. Um, a lot of it is these developers are creating malware, and that malware would then have to get sold to somebody to go implement, or sometimes they would do that piece direct. And a lot of this was around credit cards. Credit card fraud was going nuts, right? You'd write the shady malware, somebody would buy it, or you would do it, you would find a way of vulnerability, put it on a system, then you would collect all the cards, you'd have to send it to carters, carters would duplicate it, then people out there would buy them and use them, right? This operation, go through a lot of steps. And when CryptoCoin came out, the same vulnerabilities that they're putting malware on a machine, they're just like, screw it, and I don't even care about your credit cards anymore. I'm just gonna put ransomware on all your point of sale systems and you're gonna pay me to get it back. And it cut out all the middlemen. Carters are out, all the other people are out. Developers getting paid direct, it's a win-win, right? Crypto coin directly to me. Hey, everybody else is out. And it's just amazing that things like this, you know, WannaCry are still wrecking companies. Like, it was our, like two days ago, just took down somebody. This is just a known patch that hasn't been patched. And let alone like SMB v1, go turn that off. That shouldn't be in your org. There's no need for that pretty much ever. And if there is, you need mitigation control. But it's just amazing. Like, these things are just coming around wrecking orgs. And some of these, one of these companies, some shipping carrier, like, they estimated hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to recover from it. That's wild. That's wild for something not patched. Or some mitigation between it, right? And when, you know, who's paid ransomware? Who hasn't paid ransomware, right? Atlanta makes the news, ransomware. Idaho makes the news, ransomware. I think Idaho actually paid is what I read. That was exciting. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you to you to never pay ransomware. Because, like, if you got your grandma's pictures encrypted and you had nothing else and that was super important to you, that might make sense. I would just advocate to put something in place where you wouldn't have to make that choice. Um, and what they encrypt is everything. Um, we've had people with their Box accounts and Dropbox accounts and Google Drive accounts. Some of those have other mitigation controls, reversion history, rollbacks, um, more enterprise of things you pay, the more options you have. Um, but they definitely will try to encrypt every, everything you can write to. There's a reason you should uh, reduce access to just their jobs, not because you don't trust them. It's because they can just encrypt everything, right? Let's check in time here. Um, crypto jacking, yeah. 
So this is interesting. So the, the rise of CryptoCoin, uh, ballooning last year around December, going nuts. Everybody made a lot of money, right? Everybody cashed out in December, hopefully. Uh, most people didn't. Most people lost a lot of money, right? But since then, this is just this year alone, and what this graph shows you from the back is the top 10 cryptocurrency hacks of 2018. And of that, $854 million, which is astounding. We're going to hit a billion dollars this year, guys, in stolen crypto coin. And what this is to me, I'm just going to simplify it, and there's probably some crypto, per, crypto coin person who's just going to go nuts on me. Normally, everybody just calls this crypto, but in the InfoSec world, you got to say crypto coin because people get mad. Um, but what this says is, this is another software application or applications that exist that keep getting forked of each other with libraries below that are vulnerable to something. And these companies are suddenly worth billions of dollars, right? Either exchanges or directly uh, themselves, the ICOs. They're suddenly worth billions of dollars and they don't have security people or people who are looking at this stuff. And so criminals, hackers are just like, wow, oh, this is literally like compromising all this ransomware, but I can just go still in crypto coin and they can't even track it. So crypto coins going nuts. People exploiting people. I suspect we will continue to hear in the news of more ICOs, more wallets, more blockchain vulnerabilities that will come out. Why? Because there's incentive to do so. It's not that they're any more vulnerable. Um, a lot of them moved faster than they could structure for. Uh, that didn't help. But yeah, we're almost hitting a billion dollars already. By the end of this year, I think we're going to hit a billion dollars. We can maybe have a cake party, right? Billion dollars, because we're all hackers. We think with a hacker mindset, billion dollars is a lot of money. So if you ever touch in the crypto world, assume that stuff is vulnerable to some extent, such as every other software application that exists. Um, any questions off the cusp on any cryptocurrency and that? I just wanted to touch on that just because it is booming. It was like credit card wave, ransomware for a while. And now we're in the cryptocurrency just because it's easy. It's lower hanging fruit. I don't have to even go in and encrypt your system. I can just take your money. Oh, just take your money. I don't have to do anything. Just put it in Monero, flip it to Apple gift cards, go on KSL, sell a bunch of uh, MacBook Pros for three grand, win, right? Um, I do, if we have time, I think we got a little bit of time. I, I've shared this before, but I think to make you think like a hacker and teach you, I'm going to walk through a, an actual engagement, right? And the goal here is we've now fished this person and got them their creds. We've got some access of their box of whatever access they had. And that's relatively easier than it sounds in a lot of scenarios. And so you have some goals set out. You want to get local admin on that machine. And we'll talk why in just a second. And then you want to get system access on that machine. And some of these will vary um, depending on how hardened or kind of posture they have. And obviously, if it's a, this is a Windows environment. But I'd say this is a typical environment, right? In a lot of cases, the user that you get access to is a local admin, which is like amazing for a criminal or somebody doing something malicious on your machine. So with that local admin, they can do whatever they want in that box, right? And local admin means if you, somebody sends like, hey, go, go download this file, and you download it, and you can install that file, 99% of the time, you're a local admin. Uh, Google Chrome has some weird tricks it does in temporary profile. But uh, for the most part, uh, local admin is that you can install something. And you can defeat and turn off pretty much every other control that is put into place um, by anybody else. But with local admin, you want system. And the reason you want system is because with system, you can read memory. So in a typical place, a typical environment, if you have local admin on a machine, how hard is it to go from local admin to system access? Any thoughts? Very easy, very hard, complicated. It depends. We've had things that have blocked this, but it is if you run this wonderful tool. You know, if anybody's ever used Metasploit in here, uh, it's worth downloading and playing with. Probably get a VM of that. Um, get it in Kali. But it is type get system. <laughs> type get system, hit enter, escalate the system. And with system, you can type things um, like, and it will show your password in like clear text. Here you go. There's your password, clear text. You can read memory. With memory, your password is sitting there in clear text. So with that, you have one machine, and you want to take down more of that org, right? You have one machine, one access, and if that was your target goal, you're done. But a lot of cases, you want to go further. You want to get domain access. You want the IT staff. You want to escalate that to people who have more privilege than a reception desk or a kiosk or something that's sitting there, right? 
And so you just start enumerating that domain. Uh, I've been playing a lot with uh, Bloodhound. I don't know if anybody else is playing with it. They keep adding more and more tools. Bloodhound is just an enumer Windows enumeration tool. You, whatever box you have access to, you give it those access, and it just goes through and crawls through the org. And essentially will say, like, hey, you're one hop away from a computer that a highly privileged user can log into. So instead of trying to attack everything in the organization, you can go after a very specific machine to know well, if the privileged person's on that machine, that means their creds are sitting in memory on that machine, right? As we just went through. So you know a host, you know to get them. Um, in this scenario, uh, what we did is we just took the uh, credentials. This was like a PS attack tool. You essentially said, with the credentials I already have, so you already have access to one machine, right? With those credentials, what other machines in the org can I log into already? doing nothing else but just my credentials I have. And this is, again, from a legitimate engagement. But it is sometimes, surprisingly, a lot. That same person who, or kiosk, or service out there for some device that was installed, uh, a lot of times can log into almost every other machine in the organization. Well, if that's the case, then it's really easy, right? You just go get that computer that uh, Bloodhound showed you that the privileged person is on, log into it with the creds you already have, dump the hash, see their passwords, you have full domain access on that system. So in some scenarios, oh yeah, yeah, so once you grab that, I did want to show that one, but yeah, this is a clear text password of once you run that. Um, this is MimiCats, another hacking tool, um, but it will actually just dump your password straight out, password 99 exclamation point three times, uh, per this one that I was doing to show you, that it can be done. And this is not to say it's always that easy, because sometimes it's definitely not. Sometimes it's a pain and really hard and takes a lot of effort. Uh, but sometimes it's actually even easier. There's some really, <laughs> oh, this was a picture of like a firewall I actually like compromised, right? Like I penetrated that firewall. That happened. Um, but sometimes it is, it is easy, but sometimes, sometimes it's hard, but sometimes it's even easier. There's a couple cool tools that are just coming out or getting better. I guess they've been out for a little bit. They're getting better to the place where they're um, pretty much automating what I just walked you through. And the two that I know about that I'm playing with are kind of cool is Angry Puppy and Death Star. And of course, they have cool names, right? Death Star and Angry Puppy. But essentially, you put in what you have, and they will go and automate, enumerate, jump box to box, get you the creds, bring them back. Here you go. You've compromised this whole domain, right? And sometimes it's even easier, right? Depending what mitigation or lack of mitigations are in place, sometimes it's even worse. Um, security is no longer about just protecting your perimeters. It is about defending it in layers, right? It used to be, we just put up a perimeter, we don't care it's on the inside, we just care it's on the outside. And that can work, but pretty much won't for most businesses because we like things like email and web browsing and we intentionally want those to circumvent our perimeter, right? If it wasn't for those, you could run a pretty secure network for the most part. You have insider threat, you have some other things to worry about, but for the most part, that would be a pretty good network. Just a good firewall. Firewalls are pretty legit. Just put up a PFSense box, put up anything. Put up that Cisco box, maybe not that one, but one like it. Put those up and your perimeter's good. You have a good perimeter. But suddenly, you let people through. You let users through. We want that through. And security can no longer just be perimeter. It has to be layers. It has to be some group policies. It has to be mitigation. Some, oh, we'll touch on that. I got more. It has to be these type of things, right? Is getting rid of local admin on users is not hard. I might personally, my laptops, I never run as local admin on them. Why? Because that's scary. That is like root access in that box. I will create a separate account, run it as a limited user, and that's what I use. I know the password. I will use it when I need it, but if I go to a page and it pops up and is like, hey, put in your administrator password, that's a big problem. But if you're already an admin, sometimes those just run, right? So getting rid of local admin is a big deal. It's kind of hard to do in some orgs. It is achievable. I've absolutely been through orgs that have achieved it. It can work, and it can work really well. But there is some pain there to go through if you haven't done it yet. So get rid of local admin. Reduce the access, right? Ransomware, if, if Carl from accounting only has access to what Carl from accounting needs to do his job, well, suddenly accounting doesn't take down marketing, doesn't take down operations, right? Carl should only take down what he can take down. Those files that get ransomware shouldn't be like, oh, we had to pay out the ransomware for the entire organization of hundreds of millions of dollars. 
it should be like, well, Carl's counts are gone. Do we pay to get Carl's counts back, or can we restore that somehow, right? Reducing access is important, it, and a lot of people are always like, they get offended when you take away stuff. Oh, I've been here for 20 years. You can't take this away. And it's not that you're worried about them. You obviously trust them. You hire them. You keep them there. It's that what can their computer do there on their behalf? What's happening on that computer when they're not there? Right? Um, backups are very important. It's not a sexy topic, but you know, do backups on-site, off-site. Revision control is your friend. Things you can encrypt and shove up in the cloud yourself, also your friend to keep other people from getting access to those. Um, you can come to Tinfoil Hat Talks to talk about that a different time. Um, <laughs> patching, also not really a sexy topic, but absolutely orgs get completely wrecked by patching. We just went through a walkthrough on Newegg. I don't know if that's been remediated or not. It's out there on the internet, though. Showdown, go look at it. Go see what the world already knows about your IP addresses. Um, sometimes it's scary, but patching fix a lot of that stuff. Patching, if you have a good patch box, even in a dirty network, you're pretty good. That means they gotta like burn an O day on you. I'm not saying there's nobody in this room that they would do that for, but most of the people in this room, nobody would do that for, right? Nobody's using a vulnerability that nobody knows about generally on you, right? Patch your systems, mitigating controls. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff in here, anti-exploit kits, um, things that are actually kind of cool. Uh, you know, it's just simple stuff, right? You hit an org and it's like, they have no SPF record installed on their, their domain, which means that you can fish from their domain as them and they're none the wiser. That's a simple thing, legitimately takes five minutes to implement. Depending, some orgs you gotta get really long, like their ticketing comes from this and this comes from this. Um, but you can figure that out and implement something like DKM, signing, there's some easy stuff to do. Go get rid of crappy, go get rid of crappy apps. Flash, Java, do you need them? Maybe you do, if you do, keep them patched. If you don't, well they're free, they're easy, just delete it. See if you actually do need it. Um, that is actually a method I've done, go into an org, just remove all of Java off all the systems. You start getting the calls. Hey, I can't log into the HVAC system. Hey, I can't hit this. Okay, I know that computer needs it for this purpose, documented, make sure that keeps patched. That one needs it for this, documented, make sure it's patched, right? But we took it off 900 machines and three needed it. I'd say that's worth it. Things like that. Um, depending on your risk tolerance of bosses yelling at you, maybe implement that slow or aggressive. It's up to you. Um, but there's some simple ones. And user training is key. I do think if you have control of user interfaces, um, some of those talks I had this morning, is important to like give them alerts at the right times. I think during shutdown patching is a great idea. I love that idea. Why doesn't more things do that? You end, I'm gonna close Excel, it should patch me then, right? Not at the start. That makes a lot of sense. But most of us don't have control for those things, right? We don't, we generally don't have control for that. But we do have control of some of our users. And I can absolutely tell you when you have an engaging security awareness training, more people adhere to it. More and more people will come to you and be like, hey, I saw that URL and I didn't like it. And something, something didn't feel right because it was a resume, but I'm not hiring. And you're like, yeah, now you're thinking, right? Now you're thinking, why would somebody send me a resume when I'm not hiring, right? Attachments, backups, anti-exploit. When I first started doing security awareness training, I use this one in every single one. So if you ever sat through my stuff, you'll see this again. But I started doing this thing called Breach Plaza. So this will tell you kind of the, the time period when this was happening. Um, and I did update it for Home Depot. That wasn't in the first one or Target. I had to go add those because they were just big enough. But it was Breach Plaza. And I kept saying like, hey, just keep your organizations out of Breach Plaza. Like, what can you do? And granted, you will never be unhackable. You'll never be compromised. But it should be like a user email account got compromised. It shouldn't be your whole domain is down and you got to pay somebody money to get it back. It shouldn't be that kind of scenario. Some mitigation in place. The unfortunate thing, Breach Plaza filled up really fast, like really fast. When I first started, it was like, oh, I need another one, I need another one, and then it was like gone, right? And then I started filling out Breach Mall, and then Breach Mall was like gone. I'm like, ah, oh, it's just too much, I can't maintain this. But that said, Breach Mall is ever expanding. Um, we really just want to keep your org out of Breach Mall, right, to a large extent. You can have a compromise of some, some scenario, but it should be contained, right? You're never going to be perfect, sad but true. As a hacker, Maybe that's to your advantage, right? Um, things like this should be red flags as hackers, right? Or as walking in, these are these is like old school wiretap that I found in a building. It's just like straight up, they stripped the wires and legitimately tapped into it, right? You would think the world is on fire, right? The more you, sorry, this thing keeps slipping down. The world would seem like it's on fire. Uh, there seems like there's so much negative, so much bad out there. And what I would tell you is, 
relax, breathe. There is, some, there is some sting there. You will feel some sting. There is pain out there in the world. There are malicious people who want to do you and your organization harm. That's truth. It will be there. Somebody will try to compromise you. But relax. Try to take some basic steps. If you walk out of here and your password is password and you just want to update that, that's a win. That's a win for everybody, right? Take a logical step. You might not suddenly be to a one password card using a vault on your machine with this uh, proprietary rsync pushing it up to some cloud service that you're encrypting. You might not get there really fast and maybe you'll never get there. But what you should do is take a logical step to improve your posture. Maybe it's just at the end of the day, you shut down all your emails and you patch your machine. Hey, that might be a win, right? Maybe it is you do take the time to reduce your account to not be local admin. I think that'd be a big win. Take a logical step. Um, I do want to share this with you. Here's a legitimate 70 sites that you can go to and hack against them. Validate that the list's still current, but it is. But you want to get your hacking skills as a hacker of all the things you just learned, go run some angry puppy and Death Star in their organization. Um, those are a little, you want to do those in a Windows box <laughs> somewhere, but um, this is legit, this is backroom sec, and you can go and uh, hit against this. Um, there's a lot of really cool CTFs here at St. Con as well, and you can do some of those well. There's some computers downstairs in the village that have some hacking competitions that are fr pretty intro lever level. Uh, go work on those. And I'd say even if you're just like, I don't want to be a hacker, I don't want to do any of those things, it's still advantageous for you to do that. How do they do this? Why do they do this? What is the mindset behind that? What is this, you know, you get an executive to go and like, pop a Windows box, and suddenly they're coming back and like, we gotta patch things. And you're like, yeah, you gotta patch things. So there is some advantage of sending people to do these things to just understand that like, these things are possible, right? Um, and, but be careful when you do hacking stuff, you get things like this, like, you know, DigitalOcean send you emails like, you know, you go, you go log in and it's like, uh, we don't really like you, we're gonna send you an email to tell you if we like you, right? And sometimes that email's like, yeah, we're done taking your money, right? So just be careful when you do some of your hacking stuff that, uh, you know, do it on things you own, do things that are legal, and you still might piss off your VPS. Thank you.